200 years ago, on the afternoon of 27 September 1825, a large crowd watched in awe as a train of more than 30 wagons steamed slowly but surely into Stockton. This is the world's first steam-powered railway in the United Kingdom, topping a speed of 25 kilometers per hour. It was an engineering marvel of its time, turning a new page for human transportation. Today, we have many choices when it comes to traveling modes. Depending on the distances, we could ride a bike or drive a car for short distance travel. We could also use public transportation modes like the railway and airplane for longer distances. But the transportation models I've mentioned have aged. The railway were invented 200 years ago, cars were invented a century ago, and even for air travel, it was commercialized 50 years ago. We have done a lot in the past 50 years to improve speed and reliability, but we have yet to invent a new way to travel in the information age. Hyperloop is one of the few innovative technologies that is being developed in the transportation vertical with the potential to disrupt the industry. Here's what I think. Hyperloop is either going to be a boom or a huge bust. There is no middle ground. Let me explain. First of all, let's talk about Hyperloop's technology offer. Hyperloop is a combination of magnetic levitation technology and a near vacuum space. What it does is it removes both the rolling frictions on the rail and the air resistance, making its high speed possible. When Hyperloop accelerates, two sets of magnets work in concert, one set to repel and push the train up off the track, and another set to move the floating train ahead, taking advantage of the lack of friction. Once two sets of magnetic waves are established, they work in tandem to push the vehicle forward. The super speed of Hyperloop, however, is achieved through dramatically minimizing air resistance. Passenger pods move through a low pressure tube, which contains vacuums that suck out nearly all of the air. The air pressure inside the chamber is so low that it mimics the conditions of being at about 61 kilometers above sea level. This is what's promising about the idea of Hyperloop. It's a maglev train with minimum air resistance. The maglev technology is already in use where the Chinese have a recorded speed of 600 kilometers per hour, and by removing air friction, this enables a faster speed. Hyperloop started with Elon Musk's white paper. When he published it years ago, it was designed to have air bearings to travel. But of course, it is not that easy. Virgin Hyperloop tried it and quickly discovered that air bearing design was neither energy efficient nor cost effective. The air gap between the tube shaped track structure and the bottom of the pod was extremely small. Therefore, the dimensional tolerances required of the entire system were extremely high. This meant that the track needed to be nearly perfectly aligned, making it difficult to account for expansions and contractions due to temperature or other factors. To put it in plain English, we don't have the technology to build what Elon Musk proposed, and we do not think it's feasible either. I think it's fair. Elon can get imaginative at times. Right now, there are at least half a dozen major contenders building Hyperloop systems around the world. I'll quickly go through them, but I'll keep it to the realities on the ground because oftentimes companies' visions can be grand, reality is always harder. Virgin Hyperloop One is the closest to building a functional project. Founded in 2014, it has raised $485 million in funding so far. It also has conducted a human trial at a speed of 172 kilometers per hour, much slower than existing high-speed rails. Nevertheless, a great start. Virgin Hyperloop at the moment is in the stage of conducting feasibility studies. It also has a cargo application, which seems particularly interesting. Another player in the field is Hyperloop TT. So far, it has raised $31.3 million, a lot smaller than Virgin, but it seems to have a few projects ongoing, one of which is a commercial project in the UAE, but it does not seem to have started construction. Other companies in the field include Transpod, Hard Hyperloop, Navamo, and Zolaris. None has started commercial projects. Lastly, the China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation is also researching the feasibility of Hyperloop, calling it a high-speed flytrain and projecting a theoretical speed ceiling of 4,000 kilometers per hour. So it's pretty clear to me that all companies in this field are in a very early stage. 
Is the business realistic at all? The reality is, I think it's somewhere in between. Both the maglav technology and the low pressure vacuum technology exist today, but commercialization at scale is another matter altogether, which may take years, if not decades. It's so early in its product development cycle that people aren't even clear about its user segment. People often assume that Hyperloop is going to be an alternative to railways. But is that assumption right? I think not. Choosing means to travel is about cost benefit and availability. If we limit our discussions to passenger travel, we have various means of transportation and each specializes in different distances and speeds. Bikes and scooters are last mile solutions that help people get around for work or for grocery trips. Cars offer a medium distance solution helping people get around within a city from five kilometers to a hundred kilometers. When it comes to longer distance travel over a hundred kilometers, generally railway and air travel is the more comfortable solution. Though people around the world do make different choices, the Chinese built 150,000 kilometers of railway and 38,000 kilometers of high-speed rail for long distances travel, as did the Japanese and Indians. But most studies show that the American society makes use of cars and Boeing jets. 90% of long distance trips are taken by cars in the United States. The Europeans fall in between with the heavy car usage. So Hyperloop's proposition is unique. It most certainly cannot be a last mile solution or a replacement for the inner city subway systems. At the speed of a thousand kilometers per hour, it makes no sense to take Hyperloop for 150 kilometers. High speed rail is sufficient. This is also my biggest question mark regarding Virgin Hyperloop's project in India. It's far too short. While I understand the need to build initial proof of concept to show the world Hyperloop works, Virgin's Indian project promising 300 km per hour speed is simply a bad deal for the Indian people as they could have paid less to the Japanese government and build a high speed rail. And we know the Chinese now have a 600 km per hour maglev already. Coming back to Hyperloop's business model, since it is essentially a maglev train on a vacuum tube, it makes no sense to me for Hyperloop to be cheaper than maglev, not on a per passenger kilometer basis. Neither should it be safer because of the more complex and novel technology. Therefore, Hyperloop will not be able to compete with high-speed rail or traditional maglev on a per kilometer cost basis. If a Hyperloop were to have a speed slower than 600 km per hour, it loses its competitive advantage. Hyperloop technology becomes truly competitive when the speed is close to 1000 km per hour. Its high speed means travelers could save three quarter of their time on the road compared to high speed rail, which makes Hyperloop a viable competitor to air travel. So what really is vital in the coming years for these Hyperloop companies is to innovate and do better than high-speed rail. Else, I'd say it's a bust. If they started to raise public funding rather than institutional money with no viable product, run.